But we're going to start first and next with, with a real treat uh, with one of my favorite economists, Dara Nachomoglu from MIT, being interviewed by, by one of my favorite people, uh, Emerson Collective CTO and Director Rafi Kukorian, about the pyrodynamics of AI about how there's a danger that technologies like AI being introduced into society, in addition to eventually bringing a lot of prosperity and progress, can also concentrate power in the hands of the few at the detriment of agency, in this case of, for the learner, which is the opposite of what we want. So, welcome again. Uh, to our symposium on AI and education, and let's enjoy the, the interview with Daron by Rafi. I, I mean, I just have a few questions, but I figure we just chat for 15 minutes and then we call it a day. That's it. That's great. That's okay. good. Maybe one of the things I wanted to start with was like, I mean, the core idea behind power and progress, if I understand it correctly, is that technologies like AI create a dynamic that concentrate power in a few people's hands and then therefore has a depressing effect on wages, had other societal harms, large segments of society become at a disadvantage. However, mechanisms like regulation, civic action can maybe shorten or ideally prevent those periods of that which happen. Given that, and given all the things that are happening with AI right now, I'd love to get your sense of like, what's the role of education, especially in that AI, in this like AI world that we live in now? Well, I think, uh, thank you for summarizing the main idea of the book indeed uh i think the main emphasis of the book is that there is no guarantee that any technology even those that are very promising such as ai will necessarily bring shared prosperity so we have to work at it and they could become concentrated in the hands of a small group who may then use it for displacing labor reducing the role of labor and creating monopolies for them or monopolizing information in the case of AI. And so we have to find institutional and technological solutions to improve the prospects of society at large uh, in the face of these types of disruptive technologies. Now, education, of course, has a very important role, but I hesitate in jumping into education as the main solution okay. partly because both within economics and in policy circles for the last 50 years we've heard oh you know technology is running ahead the only thing you can do is education and we don't agree with that perspective first of all education is only one of the tools and second the perspective that you know, technology is going wherever it is going and we have to educate the workers differently so that they can adapt to technology, though it has some grain of truth, it's too one-sided. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that technology also is appropriate and develops in a way that's co coherent with the skills and priorities of the workforce. So it's a two-way horse, uh, two-way race in some sense. And uh, so so I think that's that's one important aspect. Now, if you look at it from the point of view of developing nations, however, including Armenia, I think the problem is more complex because you have to first adopt the technologies and mm -hmm. make sure that your workforce has the skills to be able to adopt, bring, and utilize that technology. And then you have to worry about how that technology is being used, how that technology is being developed. So for developing countries, I think education is more important because the danger is that they'll fall behind in, the, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in, this, in this process. So many developing nations, many emerging markets are very behind in the AI uh, process because they're not ready for it. They don't, their organizations are not ready for it. Their education system is not ready for it. And they, quite honestly, their politicians are ignoring all of the opportunities and the dangers that AI poses for them. And for example, for Armenia, I think has uh, some enviable and some really unfortunate positions at the moment you know the country is suffering still uh from a variety of geopolitical and economic problems and it political problems uh army the, some of the most skilled armenians have left the country and that trend doesn't seem to have 
uh, completely subsided. Uh, but on the other hand, Armenia does have a good education system. Going back to the Soviet times, it yep. was uh, an education system that tried to prepare Armenians as engineers, scientists, mathematicians, and the influence of that history is still there. So Ar Armenia has a great position to play a leadership role in the emerging world in AI technologies. And, and, and for that, of course, the education system will be critical. Okay, so maybe we can separate out education in two different forms. Like there's one, which is we need to educate everyday people. We need to educate politicians. We need to educate those. But right. how should we be thinking about, and let's assume we can do that. I mean, that's hard, but let's assume that's a given. Um, then what do we need to be doing with students, both in the sense of like preparing them to use the technology, but also be more mindful about how these technologies, so like when they become builders in the future, that they're already starting to think about right. these. You got, these, you got uh, it exactly issues. right. You got it exactly right. There really, it's a really multi-layered layer problem. One is the education of the public and politicians, and that's a very high level thing we don't want. I mean, it's okay if politicians become good at prompt engineering, but that's not what we are aiming at. <laughs> yes. We want them to understand the capabilities, the dangers, the ethical questions involved in AI. For the students, I think there are a couple of important issues and important uh, uh, dimensions. First, we want the vast majority of the students to be comfortable with the technology. So that requires them to learn some basics of artificial intelligence, including prompt engineering and how to use some of these new tools that are developing, some of the do's and don'ts of using these technologies, having enough of an understanding of the background from computer science, from you know where knowledge is coming, where reliable knowledge is coming so that they can be good and socially mindful users, while at the same time, uh, have the skills and the knowledge to create good opportunities in the labor market for them. Mm -hmm. Second, we want all of the students to be aware of what are the types of skills that are going to be in demand in the labor market. So if the students don't have the knowledge of which types of jobs are likely to be eliminated and what types of skills employers and the community in general is going to demand, I think that's not going to be good for them. So the evidence from the US is there are certain jobs that are not going to be hiring as much. For example, if you are doing very routine knowledge work like collating of information, accounting, sure. account keeping, etc. So I think we have to prepare the students for that. On the other hand, we know that a lot of creative tasks, both in the entertainment industry and in the knowledge industry are going to be still in demand. We also know employers want much more flexibility. They want a lot of social and communication skills because uh, you know, humans are still going to want human interaction, but that's where social and communication skills become important. So I think that, that knowledge has to be imparted to the students and they need to get ready for that new labor market. Finally, for a small, minority of students, uh, they will have aspirations and skills to be at the cutting edge of mm -hmm. becoming engineers or designers or computer scientists. And we need, make, we need to make sure that they get the necessary background so that they can be competitive with the students anywhere from China, from the UK, from the US who want to uh, jump into that race as well. But in that, it is also very important to bro provide that holistic picture so that when they become users of that technology, when they become employers who depend on that technology, when they become designers of that technology, they know what are the socially responsible and ethical choices, sure. where the pitfalls are. And I think that's that requires something much broader than technical education. So maybe we can talk about the educational system overall for a second. If I remember correctly, like something like nine, 10 years ago, you wrote this paper which said that the internet has this ability to completely disequalize, like there's going to create superstar teachers yes. effectively. 
Um, but you also posited that it was possible and we needed to create a system to actually try to equalize that again. Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. is that going to occur again in AI? I think it is. It is. And how I do mean, we then stop it? We, it happened a little bit with the internet, you know, the massive MOOCs, uh, the, the, the massive online courses, for example. Uh, <clears throat> things like Khan Academy that started you know, taking away some teaching tasks. But the basis of that of the slight optimism of that paper was the belief that most students, the great vast majority of students need other humans to be taught. Mm -hmm. So you cannot have an education system that's purely online. And that remains true. And I think uh, this is going to be both an opportunity and a pitfall for AI, because that's a lesson that I think the AI community has immediately forgotten. And many people within the tech world are still working on things that do not leverage the skills and the importance of teachers. Mm. So again, online courses on automated grading, automated teaching, self-teaching, those have their role, but they need to be complemented with teachers. And I think what's missing is AI tools that will make the teachers much more skilled and much better, for example, in personalized education, uh, customizing the curriculum or the real time difficulties and needs of the students and the diverse students. This is very valuable evidence shows for, for example, students from low socioeconomic background. So it is exactly the kind of tool that could create an equalizing effect. So, so I, I think this is the space where we need new technologies, but also the teachers to get ready for AI. You know, the teachers can ignore AI. That's not going to work. I and mean, we know, for example, uh, tens of millions of students in the U.S. and hundreds of millions around the world are using ChatGPT already. So ignoring uh, those developments would only lead terrible outcomes in terms of what homeworks, what uh, classroom teaching, etc., are going to lead. They can try to block it. I don't think that's going to work. So the teachers need to adapt to it. Their norms, their rules are going to have to change. But the teachers themselves, their skills and their teaching methods can change as well together with the right technology. So what you're basically saying is that instead of focusing, I mean, it's not black and white. I, I hear you on that. Instead of focusing all our time and effort on basically direct to students, we also need to be making sure that we're providing teachers the tools to make them more effective, efficient, absolutely, like amplify absolutely. the humanity of teaching. Absolutely. And, 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 and that is critical for the teachers, but it's more importantly, I, I really don't think that a, a school system, an education system, without teachers playing a central role, would be effective. I I am very thankful for your time. So maybe one last question before we. I'm just curious, given your your writings, given your thinking, and given the world we live in, what what gives you optimism? Like, what are you optimistic about? Well, you know, I think two things I'm optimistic about, but extremely cautiously. One is that we have been here before. My, the book I wrote with Simon Johnson, Power and Progress, is very historical precisely because we've been here before and there have been episodes in which we've made the wrong choices and technologies have been uh, 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 have been bad for society or for many people in society. And there have been periods in which our institutions have adapted. Uh, people have risen up when the technologies were used against them and better outcomes were obtained. So. I am very optimistic that we have it in us to remake society in a way that can benefit from technology in a fair, equal way. I also am optimistic that the new technologies are very capable and they have the uh, potential to be very pro-worker, pro-humanity, pro-democracy. Uh, so it's not true that AI can only work with authoritarians. It's not true that AI mm -hmm. is going to destroy all jobs. So that potential for helping workers is there, but very, very cautiously optimistic because I think right now we are both politically and economically at a point in the United States, especially where the tech industry has the wrong direction and is very powerful. So changing course is very difficult. Darren, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for showing up and supporting Tumo. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Rafi. It was great talking to you. Thank you.